cover chest x-rays. Um, before we get into chest x-rays, let me just um, give you a few landmarks. The question this morning, we talked about mycobacterium avium uh, complex and uh, the answer I was really pleased to see Jeff uh, reiterated. And um, the rationale, uh, if you just put an asterisk, it's uh, from the Q&A book, uh, page 8, or question 8, page 21, and um, question 3 that you just went over with Jeff on page 38 are both um, variants of the MIXAP question on the MAC disease, and you might just want to read that explanation in there. Chest x-rays will be on your exam if there uh, hasn't been a normal chest x-ray shown. So if you think you have a normal chest x-ray, it's worthwhile having some sort of systematic approach to making sure you didn't miss uh, some of the subtle findings. Often there are clues in the stem of the scenario as well to help guide you. And what I'll do over the next little bit as best as we can is uh, uh, go through a lot of x-rays and give you pattern recognition and uh, some common differentials uh, that you might see. The best approach varies from radiologist to radiologist, and we used to um, study how radiologists uh, see, scan an x-ray, and they usually are able to call a normal chest x-ray within two seconds and uh, often start interpreting it as uh, they're flipping it up onto the view box, um, and there isn't any fixed pattern. Uh, of following their eyes. But for us, uh, if you just have a clarification, make sure you know the position the x-ray was taken in, where the position of any accessory um, items are, such as central lines, endotracheal tubes, uh, surgical staples, uh, it will be helpful. Often there's uh, concerns of iatrogenic complications on the x-rays that we're trying to um, point out in the answers. In terms of uh, working from the outside in is my approach, uh, chest wall, especially looking for missing breasts uh, and signs of uh, recurrent breast cancer, pleural uh, cavity, the mediastinal structures and airway, central airway, the cardiac silhouette, and then comparing both lung parenchyma, uh, finally the relative positions of the hemidiaphragm. I have the bright lights in, in me, but uh, or on me. Uh, here you can appreciate the missing breast shadow. This patient has a prior mastectomy, and there is slight fullness here in the paratracheal window uh, where the recurrence was. Here's another patient with a missing breast shadow, and in this case, there's an elevated right hemidiaphragm and recurrent right hilar tumor. The hyla are probably the hardest areas to um, visualize, especially in uh, exam, but the most common location that they're going to want you to analyze is the aortopulmonic window, uh, which typically is concave and is made by the root of the, or the arch of the aorta and the left pulmonary artery trunk. In this patient, you can see how it get, got uh, filled in with a bronchogenic carcinoma. Look at the poster, the PA view. The main things you're trying to look for are the caliber of the trachea. Normally should be less than 2.5 centimeters. Uh, the azagous lobe or fissure is a normal variant and that's often seen in the right upper lobe um, area. The AP window we talked about. Usually the left hilum is slightly higher than the right and um, the left pulmonary artery goes over the left main stem. So the uh, left main bronchus is uh, depressed. The uh, cardiac silhouette, uh, the, on the PA view, the chamber that isn't seen is the right ventricle. Look for the bronchovascular markings and make sure it's symmetric and not hypo. Uh, hyperlucent or oligemic and uh, often because of the liver on the right and the heart above the diaphragm on the left 
the right hemidiaphragm is about one uh, centimeter higher than the on the right side. If the PA view looks normal, you might be missing something that's hiding under the clavicles behind the heart, such as a diaphragmatic hernia and, uh, or below the hemidiaphragm. As you'll um, answer later on, about 15% of the x-ray is seen only, uh, of the lung fields are seen best by the lateral view. And so if, if it doesn't look uh, abnormal on the PA view, make sure you check the lateral x-ray as well. It's usually given for a reason. Here's an example where you may have detected this asymmetric opacification in the right apex, which over time did get filled in. This was a missed pancoast uh, or superior sulcus tumor. Patient presented to the neurologist with right arm pain and um, the cervical exploration was negative. So this is something that uh, could have been picked up, usually best by MRI if you're worried about neurovascular involvement. Here's a patient who has an air fluid level that you may be able to appreciate behind the heart and uh, complaining of chronic cough and due to gastroesophageal reflux and a diaphragmatic hernia. The lateral x-ray, as I mentioned, accounts for about 15% of the parenchyma that isn't seen on the PA view. And the areas you want to focus on are the retrosternal airspace, um, which would be filled by medias anterior mediastinal masses. The right ventricle often um, abuts the lower third of the sternum, but in enlarged or pathologic conditions uh, will occupy more uh, of that space. The um, esophagus and posterior tracheal areas are best visualized using the lateral. And people, depending on their um, appetite, refer to the hyalur adenopathy um, that can be seen in, in conditions like lymphoma or sarcoidosis as either a bagel or donut sign. And the hole in the, uh, in the donut or the bagel is made up by, that, uh, by the left main stem bronchus. The fissures are um, displaced and it can be appreciated on the lateral view. Uh, the right uh, transverse fissure or minor fissure is uh, best seen on the, the lateral. And we'll go through some examples of displaced fissures for volume loss in a little bit. The costophrenic area is important and can be filled with fluid or thickening or tumor. And this is a good clue here. If you scan the x-ray as you go inferiorly, the, um, because there's less soft tissue overlying the x-ray, the, um, it gets darker. And finally, you can use the lateral to help you localize uh, a nodule that you may see on the PA view as to whether it's um, anterior or posterior or outside of the lungs itself. Well, I can sit here and show you lots of x-rays. Best is just to cover up any uh, labels that you have on your jackets and go uh, check a whole bunch of x-rays. Um, since it's cram time for exams, uh, the other book you could refer to that I've found helpful is by J.C. Reed on uh, plain film differential diagnosis and has uh, quick scenarios and lots of pictures, both chest x-rays and CTs in there. I mentioned uh, make sure you look under the clavicles behind the heart and below the diaphragm. Yeah. Make sure you compare the lung fields for asymmetry. And if you see one abnormality that's pretty uh, obvious, uh, they'll probably be hiding another abnormality such as a pneumothorax or a lower lobe collapse. Uh, so look for that if it seems too obvious. Uh, Look at the lateral if it's given, and then check the stem to see what they've said about previous x-rays, if any. We'll go through some patterns of volume loss now. The key uh, features to look for are shift of the mediastinum, change in the angle of the fissures, an elevation of the hemidiaphragm, and then some more indirect clues, such as compensatory hyperinflation, which 
most, is most helpful in a left upper lobe collapse, uh, narrowing of the in ipsilateral intercostal spaces, and then change in the shift in the relative position of the hyla. And then here's some typical signs, and I'll just go through these. There's examples of these also in your book from pages 757 to 770. Here's a patient who has a reverse S sign. This is uh, an opacification of the right upper lobe. So this is an example of a displaced minor fissure due to an ex uh, extrinsic compression of the right upper lobe bronchus. That's what fills the space. And in this patient, it was a bronchogenic carcinoma. If it was an endobronchial lesion, you'd expect a concave um, shape instead of a S shape, a reverse S shape. Here's a patient who's got a right middle lobe process, and in this case, it silhouettes the right heart border. It um, is best appreciated on the lateral. Usually the minor fissure would be here. The oblique fissure runs this way, and when you get collapse of the right middle lobe, that filling in uh, converges on it, so you get this wedge-shaped defect. Here's an example of how the elevated right hemidiaphragm um, appears on somebody who's otherwise overpenetrated, but the lateral, instead of going, continuing to get darker as you go down, does opacify here, suggesting um, consolidation or collapse of the right lower lobe. And in this case, the uh, lower lobe collapses if this is the oblique fissure. Um, the the oblique fissure moves in a uh, triangular direction this way as the collapse uh, gets worse. So this is an example of right lower lobe collapse. Here's an example of the sail sign. Um, the left lower lobe here is collapsed. You get uh, silhouetting of the left hemidiaphragm, and this is more dense and uh, filled then in the retrocardiac space than it should be. And to confirm that on the lateral, you can see how you lose this uh, uh, increasing darkness as you go down to, uh, toward the diaphragm. But there are other causes of elevated hemidiaphragm besides volume loss. Look at uh, subpulmonic effusion, and usually a decubitus view would help in that uh, setting. The um, ipsilateral volume loss due to pulmonary fibrosis or uh, endobronchial obstruction, as we talked about earlier. Diaphragm weakness, uh, either phrenic nerve injury or other trauma to the diaphragm. And subdiaphragmatic uh, processes such as on the right side, liver abscess, um, tumor, and uh, on the left side, splenomegaly. The um, solitary pulmonary nodule is also a favorite one for evaluation purposes. The differential for a malignant uh, process or suggested malignant uh, condition would be if you have a patient who's over age 45, who's had a new or growing nodule over the past two years, uh, a prior malignancy increases your chance of this being a malignant recurrence uh, to about 70 to 75 percent, which means 20 to 25 percent of the time it may still be a benign inflammatory condition. Um, pattern of calcification, I'll give you some specifics, and there's some in your book. The uh, uncalcified nodule is worrisome. Um, the patients who have certain types of uh, fast-growing tumors may outstrip their, the blood supply and form cavitary lesions. Uh, but again, tuberculosis and other inf infectious conditions, such as the ones Dr. Rabatin mentioned, uh, need to be considered. Smoker, obviously, especially um, the older patient, and um, size, especially if it's above three centimeters. Spiculation, I'll show you some examples of that. 
most of the time is uh, certainly worrisome for malignancy. Looks relatively normal on the chest x-ray, but here behind the right hemidiaphragm is a uh, rounded opacity, which turned out to be a missed bronchogenic carcinoma, obviously detected now. Here's this speculated starburst pattern of a malignant adenocarcinoma. Sometimes these are also uh, maybe secondary to scar and then there's a conversion of the scar into a malignant uh, process. And the other thing to look for in a peripheral nodule is the presence of air bronchograms. If you see air bronchograms, it may be an inflammatory uh, airspace process, but if it's been there for a while and slowly growing, think about alveolar cell or adenocarcinoma and um, lymphomas. Dense central calcification often signifies a benign granulomatous process. Sometimes you'll even see tiny dots around it it's called satellite lesions, which again would favor more of a a benign inflammatory reaction. Here's a patient who appears to have a nodule. It's uh, opaque. It's also, I don't think you can appreciate it well, but on the lateral it's sort of ellipsoid and sits in the region of the right fissure, minor fissure. And this turned out to go away with diuresis. So this is loculated effusion. Um, and so not everything that appears nodular on x-ray uh, should be considered for biopsy. The other concerns or differentials of pseudotumors are people who have asbestos exposure, especially um, if there's in the history in the stem, there's evidence of a auto mechanic, a brake liner, a shipyard worker. Think about uh, plural plaques. And then, um, as this morning we were talking about arterial venous malformations, if this nodule has what appears to be feeder vessels to it, um, think, about, think about arterial venous malformations. You wouldn't want to uh, biopsy those too aggressively. Um, the, the diagnostic test in that case would be a pulmonary angiogram. And uh, the hope would be if it's causing symptoms or shunt effects, uh, that you might be able to embolize it. Some of these uh, feeder vessels get bigger than a centimeter in size and uh, may go on to uh, require surgical resection. The other for AV malformations, um, you can get in situ thrombosis and paradoxical embolism. The other risk factor is um, uh, mycotic aneurysms to the brain. That's, uh, those were single nodules. To upper limit of a nodule is about three centimeters, and beyond that, we start calling them masses. Uh, here's an example of multiple masses. If it's in the usually the lower lung zones, you think about hematogenous dissemination of a tumor, and this turned out to be metastatic colon cancer. And here's another more advanced case, uh, fairly diffuse, but more lower lung zone predominant. So when you have masses, you have benign inflammatory conditions, you have neoplastic processes, you also have um, large masses which may change over time and cavitate. If they start cavitating, you worry about uh, septic pulmonary embolism, staphylococcal involvement, uh, vasculitis, which is what this person has, uh, it turned out to be Wegener's, and this is a C anca staining pattern. And the other um, are some of the malignancies, the angiosarcomas that can do this. Kaposi sarcoma occasionally can can uh, behave in a multiple nodular fashion. Talked about bronchiectasis a bit this morning. Here's an example, a plain x-ray example of coarse uh, cystic bronchiectasis. This person turned out to have uh, hypogammaglobulinemia and, and had diffuse lower lung zone involvement. 
remember in cystic fibrosis, it's more of an upper lobe bronchiectatic pattern. We used to do bronchograms, uh, the diagnostic test of choice for suspected bronchiectasis is high resolution CT and what you're looking for is abnormal tapering of uh, the airways. Usually they should taper smoothly and disappear by the, the junction of the inner two-thirds to the outer third of the lung. Here's some mucus that's pooled and uh, retained in the dilated um, structure. Also, if you look at um, in cross-section, the airway is usually the same size as its accompanying blood vessel, and in bronchiectatic patients, the airway becomes much larger than the uh, small white dot that comes with it, so it's called the signet ring sign. So just a couple of differentials or things to consider when you look at CT scans. Here's a patient uh, similar to the one we talked about this morning, a uh, woman with chronic cough, um, constitutional symptoms, including weight loss, and had evidence of recurrent pneumonitis and right middle lobe bronchiectasis, but in addition had these little ditzels around it and uh, turned out to have non-tuberculous mycobacterial superinfection. Okay, um, those are nodules and airway diseases. The other uh, pattern to think about are the airspace uh, filling defects, and so I use um, fluid pus, blood, protein cells, and then other. And um, when you think about alveolar filling, uh, obviously pulmonary edema, cardiogenic is the obvious one, but many non-cardiogenic causes, especially illicit drug use from cocaine or heroin, are important to keep in mind. The, um, some of those patients can actually get complicating alveolar hemorrhage and have uh, frank, bright red hemoptysis in addition to their desaturation. Aspirin um, can also cause non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and brainstem injuries uh, uh, can produce this pattern. In infectious pneumonias, opportunistic pneumonias, as uh, Dr. Rabat nicely covered. Patients who have alveolar prognosis, and this is either primary uh, phospholipidosis or secondary to uh, conditions like PCP. The cellular or malignant causes if, uh, uh, can be multifocal alveolar cell cancer or lymphoma. And then I think a couple that have showed up on um, internal medicine board exams as well are the older patient who's constipated and using a lot of mineral oil and aspirating some of it or using a lot of um, VIX uh, fatty kind of products in their nose for chronic con nasal congestion and ends up with aspiration lipoid pneumonia. The, um, other entity are the rheumatic conditions, which may be complicated by fleeting pulmonary infiltrates and a condition that may or may not respond to steroids called BOOP, bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia. Upper lobe predominant uh, infiltrates or disorders. Um, Dr. Rosenau, who's kind enough to give me a lot of these slides, uh, used to refer to these as the cysts, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, which may be asymptomatic upper lobe involvement, silicosis, cystic fibrosis, and histiocytosis X. Histiocytosis X may present asymptomatically in a smoker usually, and the other part that they may present with is with a pneumothorax. So you might have some diffuse upper lobe infiltrate and then a pneumothorax is your clue that it, that's the condition you're dealing with. The treatment in that case is just making sure they're stopped smoking and obviously correcting the pneumothorax. Uh, other conditions, and an asthmatic who's coughing up brown mucus plugs, think about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Patients with more axillary predominant infiltrates, um, 
or on a CT scan, uh, the wording of ground glass infiltrates. Think about an alveolit alveolitis of some kind from uh, an environmental exposure. Ankylosing spondylitis is a rare uh, cause of upper lobe disease, uh, and that is also important because these patients, if they get fusion of their costovertebral angles and their chest wall, and they get a crooked neck, uh, which is fixed, they can have quite a significant restrictive um, lung physiology. And finally, um, a favorite a few years ago where the upper lobe infiltrates due to pneumocystis in patients who had previously received nebulized pentamidine. This uh, example here is um, from the last case there, or the latter, and um, actually, the, can anyone tell me what the primary pathology, why this person got PCP, or um, nebulized pentamidine? If you look at the bone joints, they're pretty destroyed. Somebody with recurrent traumatic hemarthroses. This person actually turned out to have hemophilia and got blood transfusion and then developed uh, secondary uh, AIDS. Here's an asymptomatic patient with macronodular, I don't know if you can appreciate that, macronodular upper lobe disease. The three things to think about in an asymptomatic individual are silicosis, histiocytosis X, and sarcoidosis. And the CT in this patient shows just a lot of uh, ditzels, and because there's no real bronchocentric distribution and the history was suggestive of uh, silicosis exposure, this patient actually has a, a pattern compatible with silicosis. In these diffuse infiltrative disorders, it's also helpful to look for evidence of heart failure and presence of curly B lines. Uh, the two main differentials to think about is left heart failure and lymphangitic carcinomatosis. If you see curly B lines in a patient with lymphangitic carcinomatosis, again, this, although it's a cyst, is more lower lung zone predominant presumably related to hematogenous dissemination and more pulmonary vascular blood flow into the bases than the upper lung zones. Um, but these patients are often symptomatic and often die within six months, so you wouldn't want to spend a lot of time doing invasive diagnostic uh, confirmation if this is what you're dealing with. Um, heart failure, obviously, trials with uh, diuretics and other heart failure uh, interventions are the way you would confirm that approach. And um, some rare causes, which you probably won't see on your boards, but just to keep in mind, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, these patients may have smooth thickening of the interlobular septa from venular occlusion and uh, often present with pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. Paraseptal emphysema, in this case, the lines are not thick, but the surrounding distal alveolar uh, air spaces are destroyed and give you um, a mimic uh, uh, curly B lines. And finally, a smooth muscle proliferative disorder called lymphangiolaryomyomatosis. We'll have Dr. Chutka try to practice saying that three times fast later. So here's a patient who's got diffuse uh, bilateral in reticulonodular infiltrates High-resolution CT chest shows nodular septal, interlobular septal thickening. Here's another one down here. And this person also has a previous mastectomy. This is recurrent lymphangitic carcinoma from breast cancer. Another interstitial lung disorder, and uh, Dr. Axman will cover diffuse lung disease in much more detail on Tuesday. But here's somebody who's got low lung volumes, more prominent reticulonodular infiltrate, uh, 
in the early stages in pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis tends to be more subpleural. So you may have a normal chest x-ray in up to 25% of these patients. But the CT is fairly pathognomonic or fairly classic and in that it in, there's subpleural involvement with honeycomb changes and uh, on exam you may uh, also hear the Velcro crackles. Pleural disease, uh, pleural effusions, what you want to look for is, is there adjacent or accompanying chest wall involvement by, for example, a sarcoma or rib destruction? Um, is there mediastinal shift? If, there, if the effusion is large, there should be shift away from the side of the effusion. And if you don't see that, you have to suspect other uh, concomitant processes. And in this person, he also had uh, left lower lobe collapse and the, this was a malignant diffusion from a endobronchial bronchogenic carcinoma. Look for adjacent or contralateral adenopathy. I don't see any there. And then, important to remember in refractory or problematic effusions that you're not dealing with a pericardial disease such as tuberculosis or constrictive pericarditis. And uh, this might be a favorite for exams because it involves a systemic disorder, so multi-system process that manifests as a, um, a challenging effusion. The others are patients who have hypoalbuminemia or uh, trauma below the diaphragm and then get a secondary um, sympathetic effusion. You have to look for drug-induced pleural effusions and we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Trauma, as I mentioned, and if you have a pulmonary embolism, first of all, only about 10% of pulmonary emboli infarct because of the dual blood supply to the lung. And in those patients, you often get a small effusion. If you get a massive effusion, that's pretty uncommon in somebody with pulmonary emboli. So think of something else. Here's a patient uh, I saw when I was in Victoria, Canada, um, who ended up having a large uh, problematic uh, um, bilateral pleural effusion, but also had this um, globular heart and turned out to have metastatic uh, lung cancer to both the pericardium and the pleural space. In terms of uh, the immunocompromised host, I think Dr. Rabatin covered these very well. If you have an abnormal chest x-ray in an immunocompromised host, think about opportunistic infections um, with newer therapies, um, opportunistic neoplasms uh, to the lung and other areas is important to consider. Progress, progression of the underlying uh, disease, iatrogenic complications such as uh, drug-induced pulmonary edema, uh, transfusion-related acute lung injury, that's usually within 4 to 24 hours of receiving the transfusion and um, radiation therapy. It, if you have um, an unrelated process, heart failure from fluid overload in the po immediate post-transplant uh, era or area, for example, and pulmonary infarct from, um, from immobilization and um, malignancy. And if you think you've identified the problem, just make sure that uh, you're aware that 25% of the time there might be more than one of these. HIV infection, there's different patterns. Um, diffuse opacities, think about pneumocystis, Kaposi's, and uh, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. Here's an example of these trophozoite cystic forms of PCP in a alveolar protonaceous uh, uh, background. Nodules, which may or may not cavitate, think about Kaposi's sarcoma, septic emboli, or uh, right heart involvement, valvular endocarditis, fungal infections, and uh, mycobacterial disease. <coughs> 
remember the mycobacterial response is uh, suboptimal, so you may have atypical granulomatous reactions uh, or um, apparently normal lung parenchyma but disseminated mycobacterial disease. Adenopathy, it's uh, usually not attributed to the HIV itself when you think about mediastinal adenopathy. Uh, think about infection, Kaposi's, and lymphoma. The pneumothorax, I think the favorite for the exam uh, is a subpleural uh, cavitation of a pneumocystis uh, nodule. And um, finally, for effusions, there's primarily infection and lymphomas or sarcomas to think about. Atrogenic lung disease in the era of safety would be an important consideration. The differential of drug-induced uh, lung disease is on page 799 of your syllabus, and uh, that would be one worth a while to, a shopping list worthwhile looking at. Uh, Radiation injury, either pneumonitis in the first six months after radiation therapy or uh, radiation fibrosis a little later on in the course. Um, oxygen, especially high dose oxygen above 60% for more than, 20, uh, more than 72 hours in an ICU patient, you'd have to think about oxygen radical injury and um, secondary non-cardiogenic uh, events. Post bronchoscopy, usually a transient left sided um, problem, uh, especially if you're thinking about um, injecting an a varix and then uh, for sclerotherapy, and uh, then the patient has a fever post, uh, post EGD and sclerotherapy. Think about um, an iatrogenic complication post thoracotomy, usually in conjunction with atrial dysarrhythmias. Here's a patient who's um, on management for heart failure and arrhythmias and has a non-contrast CT scan. And um, what do you think? What drug? Right, right, amiodarone. And the clue is this infiltrate um, is hyperdense and amiodarone because of the iodide content in it, tends to give you a hyperdense infiltrate. Obviously, the differential is uh, pneumonia in that patient, heart failure, and pulmonary embolism. So other patterns of drug-induced lung disease, um, interstitial pneumonitis, fibrosis is the most common, and there's a list there. Pulmonary edema, as I mentioned, Think about uh, in the um, inner city population and the drug addict population, the role of or problem with cocaine and heroin, narcotics, and aspirin is another example. Drug-induced pleural effusion, the most common drugs. Um, I think procainamide shown up a couple of times in past exams. Hydralazine, um, dilantin, and isoniazid. Usually this drug-induced lupus problem is um, not anti-double-stranded DNA, but is due to antihistone antibodies, and that would be a, another distinguishing factor. Also, these patients don't get um, CNS involvement as they may with um, systemic lupus. Bronchospasm and, uh, from aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents uh, are favorites for the board exam, as well as patients who are being treated for glaucoma with nonspecific beta blockers. Mediastinal widening, I'll show you an example there. Uh, the thing to think about are um, dilantin with mediastinal adenopathy and um, steroids, systemic steroids, where you get centripetal deposition and mediastinal lipomatosis. Pulmonary hypertension is not very common in terms of drug-induced, but it is um, in some of the plastics industries, and the agent uh, may be trimolytic anhydride. Finally, with uh, mediastinal disorders, um, 
The most common masses you'll see, first of all, in the superior mediastinum, think about a substernal goiter. In the anterior mediastinum, there's actually five um, in, uh, T's in your differential. The most common, though, is uh, thymoma. The other four are listed in your syllabus, but uh, would include keratomas, thoracic uh, aorta problems, terrible uh, lymphomas, and um, what's the other one? Thyroid, right. The uh, middle mediastinal problems here, metastatic uh, disease to the nodes or lymphoma. The other is sarcoidosis. Posterior mediastinal masses often seen on the lateral or with the CT scan uh, are neurogenic, um, usually hopefully benign tumors, but about 10% of the time may be malignant. Besides tumors, um, think about inflammatory and vascular abnormalities in terms of an enlarged um, mediastinum. And a favorite one, as you'll also see a little later in the question answer period, is coarctation of the aorta where you have a dilated aorta and a patient comes in with problematic hypertension. Uh, think about physical exam and um, echo or another study to look for um, vascular abnormalities. And finally, if it's accompanied in a traumatic or a pneumothorax patient with a mediastinal crunch, um, subcutaneous emphysema, think about pneumomediastinum. So just some upper or some mediastinal uh, x-ray abnormalities. Here's a superior mediastinal abnormality. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there's a displacement of the posterior wall of the trachea. This is due to a substernal or retrosternal goiter. Here's a patient who's got a little widening of that mediastinum here, and on the lateral you can see, instead of having a clear retrosternal airspace, there's this anterior mediastinal mass. I'll use this x-ray to also show you the normal RV adjacency to the sternum, which is lower third. As that uh, RV gets enlarged, it'll occupy more of this retrosternal um, space. So that's uh, the main things I'd want to talk about. I have 2.7 minutes. So uh, I'll give you some quick uh, rare cases. Here's a patient who's got upper lobe fibrocavitary disease and uh, a bamboo spine, it's enclosing spondylitis. Here's a patient with upper lobe cystic disease and um, has a smoking history as well as a previous recurrent, uh, previous pneumothorax, histiocytosis X, right? Here's just a smoker with a normal FEV1, doesn't want to quit smoking and had an incidental um, I'm not quite sure why the CT was done, but uh, you can see central lobular emphysema. So it, sometimes you have to be careful how, what you interpret as cysts and just airspace uh, destruction. Here's an example of an x-ray. This patient was rheumatic, uh, had rheumatoid arthritis and was treated with steroids. There's progressive widening of this mediastinum. If it's a smooth widening, think about mediastinal lipomatosis as confirmed by this uh, CT scan. If it's lumpy, bumpy, then you have to worry about uh, lymph, uh, lymph node enlargement. For example, a patient with lymphoma. Here's a patient who's uh, got multiple airspace involvement, turned out to be alveolar hemorrhage uh, syndrome. And uh, this is a granular staining pattern of the uh, membrane. Think about lupus. And usually we don't do lung biopsies in these. We try to get the diagnosis from uh, blood and the urine, uh, I mean the kidney biopsy. And if they sh show you faces as well as lung disease, uh, here's a patient who's got right scleroderma, telangiectasias, and the um, problems with oral absorption or oral intake. Here's somebody with lupus and a butterfly rash that's photosensitive.
Question number one. A 45-year-old man presents with a dry, non-productive cough, fatigue, exertional dyspnea when he walks uphill. He has smoked one pack of cigarettes daily for 10 years. On examination, he is in no acute distress and has no clubbing or cyanosis. Auscultation of the chest reveals late inspiratory bivasilar crackles. Posterior, anterior, and lateral chest radiographs appear normal. Laboratory studies reveal hemoglobin of 15, FVC of 3.5 liters, 65% of predicted, FEV1, 3.3 liters, 90% of predicted, DLCO of 15, 48% of predicted, PO2 of 70, PCO2 25. The best diagnostic test for further evaluation of this patient is number one, CT of the chest, number two, high resolution computed tomography of the chest, Number three, open lung biopsy. Number four, transbronchial lung biopsy. Number five, test for alpha-1 antitrypsin level. Correct answer is number two, high resolution CT of the chest. Go to question number two. A 50-year-old never smoker presents with a two-month history of intermittent cough and streaky hemoptysis associated with five-pound weight loss. He denies fever, night sweats, or past exposure to active tuberculosis. Plain chest radiograph is shown. The most helpful diagnostic test would be number one, bronchoscopy, number two, CT of the chest, number three, fungal serologies, number four, sputum cytology and cultures, number five, pulmonary function testing with methicoline challenge. The picture is also on page 760 in your handout or in your syllabus if you want to take a look. It's an example of a left upper lobe collapse. Great. They can do it blind almost. So the main point here is uh, left upper lobe collapse in this patient with that x-ray was uh, due to a broncholith and you had the choice between a CT chest which would help you get there but in terms of a diagnosis, uh, visualization and then sampling would have been the right choice. So um, it's the best answer, right? Thank you. I think we've got the slides coming. We'll go to question number three and give this a try. The next step in evaluating the abnormality seen on the chest radiograph of this asymptomatic 48-year-old non-smoker would be number one, transthoracic needle biopsy, number two, bronchoscopy with transbronchial biopsy, number three, pulmonary angiography, number four, tuberculin skin testing, number five, induced sputum for cytology. Good. Correct answer is pulmonary angiography. I believe that was uh, pulmonary AV malformation. Is that right? right? Mm -hmm. Question number four. Very good, Dr. Chick. I heard it before. Question number four. 65-year-old man presents with a chronic cough and 20-pound weight loss over the past eight months. He is a 40-pack-year smoker who quit two years ago. Plain chest radiograph is shown. The most likely cause of the radiographic appearance is number one, tuberculosis, number two, lymphoma, number three, metastatic bronchogenic carcinoma, number four, pneumonia, number five, aspiration pneumonitis. This also on, the, uh, on page 760. I trust you won't read the legend. Very good. Question, the answer is number three, metastatic bronchogenic carcinoma. I just want to mention the uh, point if you see an obvious lesion, make sure you look for a second abnormality. And in this patient, it's, the, uh, it's a syntachronous uh, tumor with the um, lesion in the left mid-lung zone as well as the left lower lobe collapse. So actually the diagnosis was made by bronchoscopy. Question number five. What percentage of chest abnormalities are seen on the lateral view, but, quote, hidden on the posterior anterior chest x-ray? Number one, 5%. Number two, 15%. Number three, 25%. Number four, 40%. Number five, 65%. Correct answer is number two, 15%. We'll go to question number six. This is the chest x-ray of a 42-year-old never smoker with problematic hypertension. The next best step to establish the diagnosis is number one, mediastinoscopy, number two, sputum cytology, 
Number three, pulmonary angiography. Number four, bronchoscopy. Number five, physical examination. Correct answer is number five, physical examination. Yeah, looking for a radiofemoral delay. Uh, it's the cheapest test, I think, uh, if you can get into your doctor's office. And the other um, test would be an echocardiogram. There's also an example of this uh, picture in page 764. Question number seven. You are asked to see a 32-year-old woman for recurring pulmonary infections for over 10 years. Pseudomonas has been cultured several times. On exam, clubbing is present and there is expiratory slowing. Chest x-ray is shown. The best test to establish the diagnosis would be, number one, high-resolution chest CT, number two, bronchoscopy with biopsy, number three, tuberculin skin testing, number four, HIV serology, number five, sweat chloride. Correct answer is number five, sweat chloride. Great. Uh, so it's not the abnormal CFTR genotype. And uh, other things to remember in the young patient with obstructive lung disease um, and chronic productive cough or upper lobe bronchiectasis are the presence of clubbing, uh, infertility, weight loss or malabsorptive sim symptoms, and nasal polyposis. Question number eight. All but one of the following diffuse lung diseases frequently present with a predominantly upper two-thirds distribution. Number one, silicosis. Number two, cystic fibrosis. Number three, lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Number four, sarcoidosis. Number five, Langerhans granulomatosis or histiocytosis X. Correct answer is number three, lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Question number nine. A 50-year-old automobile mechanic presents with a six-month history of mild exertional dyspnea. Auscultation of the chest is normal and there is no cyanosis or clubbing. The most likely explanation for the radiographic abnormality on this patient's chest x-ray is number one, silicosis, number two, asbestos-related lung disease, number three, advanced bronchiectasis, number four, severe pulmonary fibrosis, number five, lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Correct answer is number two, asbestos-related lung disease. Great. Um, this just points out that what you see isn't always within the lung parenchyma itself. This is an example of a shaggy heart border due to pleural plaque involvement of the adjacent um, pleural react reflection around the mediastinal structures. There's also these hazy opacities in the lung which when you see that, think about pleural-based uh, 